Hi everyone, my name is Megan Whale and I'm the um, Associate Director of Communications in the Division of Marketing Communications and I'm so happy to be here for our first teaching forum. I'm going to be moderating the question and answer session of this event. Um, but before we get to that section, I would like to introduce our president, Dr. Vianne Timmons, and I believe she has a few remarks to get us started. Thank you so much, Megan. Hi everyone. Welcome back. Happy New Year. So 2021. I am definitely looking forward to it. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'll just mention, I am Brianne Timmons. I'm your university president. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. I want to acknowledge the lands in which Memorial University's campuses are situated. We are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothuk, the Mi'kmaq, the Innu, and the Inuit of this amazing, beautiful province. You know, some of you might know that I'm a teacher, uh, and I say that with great pride because I do believe it's a noble profession. I did my uh, Bachelor of Special Education at Acadia University, and then I did my Master's in Special Education at Gonzaga University in Spokane, a Jesuit University in Spokane, Washington. And then I did my Educational Psychology uh, PhD at University of Calgary, but I always taught in in my early careers. And I was chair of the education department at St. Avex University and the dean of education um, at University of Prince Edward Island. And then I went on to into my academic administrative career. But I always love teaching and I don't teach a course now, but I often go in and do talks, especially in my field of study, which is inclusive practices for children with disabilities. Uh, you know, since COVID-19 began, Memorial University, you have made a tremendous effort to focus on teaching and learning. And it's a backbone of our university. Uh, and its value has never been more evident than it is today now. You know, while our classrooms may look empty, there are virtual classrooms everywhere, uh, giving students valuable learning experience. And it's, sometimes it's not easy to stay connected with each other and with your students while teaching remotely. Um, I know I've been on video calls where children come in, where um, pets come in, and uh, I know that happens to you while you're teaching in your classrooms. But I wanna commend you in your efforts to adapt your face-to-face -face courses to an online environment. Years ago, when I was at the University of Prince Edward Island, I began teaching online, and that would have been in um, the late 1990s, early 200s, 2000s, and it was a, it was for me such a learning curve. So I know the learning that it takes and the effort, um, and how sometimes you have to get out of your comfort zone as you explore these new technologies and approaches. The onset of remote teaching and learning brought our support services for instructors and stu students to the forefront. And Gavin is here. Um, you and your team, Gavin, you did, have done an amazing job. The responsiveness of your unit helped our faculty members, instructors, and students with this large scale shift. And I think your team is uh, on hand today to offer solutions to questions that any of you in the audience may have. So. I want to hear, we want to hear your experiences, your successes this thus far, and we want to hear how you've adapted to remote instruction. I want to learn from you. We all do. And um, this is a chance for you not just to learn from each other, but to lean on each other. So I'm going to turn it back to Megan and I'm going to get up and close the doors so that it's quiet in my office. Uh, so go ahead, Megan. Actually, I believe that Dr. Watson might have a few remarks to get us started. Am I correct? Yes, you're right, Megan. I do have a few remarks. Um, thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Megan. Um, thanks, Vianne, for those uh, opening comments. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Gavin Watson, and I'm the Associate Vice President of Teaching and Learning uh, and Director of uh, Memorial Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning, otherwise known as CITL. Uh, my personal pronouns are he, him, um, and I'm also an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Education. Uh, I joined uh, Memorial University in 2018. So, um, Vianne, while I'm uh, not as new as you, I'm certainly um, still uh, have the opportunity of meeting uh, people for the first time uh, and, um, and, and uh, really uh, getting to, to know the institution. 
Um, my own academic background is in environmental education, uh, but since my own PhD, I've been working as an educational developer. These are staff members uh, at universities whose primary focus is on supporting the continued professional development of faculty members uh, as educators. So, um, you know, my own background would have been uh, in the outdoor classroom, but also in the higher education classroom. And I work to um, integrate that experience and the research that I conduct to this day into teaching and learning higher education into my own work. Um, I continue to work with uh, staff, faculty, and instructors across the institution to improve the quality of teaching and learning um, here at MUN, and then um, as I can nationally. Um, I obviously have a teaching philosophy and a core among those beliefs are uh, my work having uh, its most practice when it's relevant um, and when it's social and when we engage in it uh, over our lifetimes. And I just wanna uh, agree with uh, Dr. Timmons that um, the shift to remote and the shift online can um, really um, cause us to pause and, and consider just how our philosophy applies in different uh, modalities. So, you know, I've said learning social, but I also know that um, online can sometimes feel uh, disengaged. And I know that um, uh, faculty and instructors have been working hard in, in um, grappling with just some of those challenges as, as they shift online. Um, during this past year, uh, the pandemics impacted our priorities on how we teach, learn, and communicate. For us in CITL, um, and I have to say, I'm so incredibly proud of the work that my staff have uh, done in order to uh, support the institution. Um, you know, I really do believe that um, uh, we've uh, uh, listened to the community and um, in intended to improve the kind of work that we've done. That doesn't mean that we can't continue to improve. And that's one of the things that I think it'll be important to hear from uh, folks today, um, just around uh, the ways and hows uh, uh, where there's still a need for um, support as, as we uh, continue to teach and work remotely. But I'm also interested in um, hearing about how we move forward. Um, I have fingers and toes crossed that, um, you know, come the end of the year that we'll be ready to return to uh, physical classrooms. Uh, but there will be learnings that we'll take from this shift uh, to remote that we'll want to continue in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Um, as far as CITL is concerned, understanding the needs of our students and instructors has been really important. You might be familiar with the fact that we conducted um, institutional surveys, a student survey and an instructor survey, and the themes that emerged helped inform just uh, the approaches that we took and the kind of supports that we provided. Um, the surveys um, uh, point out that it's uh, very important to continue working to, together across staff, faculty, instructor, and student lines to improve teaching and our teaching and learning experience at the institution. Um, and that's why it's important to focus on um, sharing successes because um, while we know there's been challenges, we also know that there's been great learning. Um, and I'm really excited to, to hear about those successes. Um, and the teaching forum is also a place to share uh, not only what's worked, but uh, perhaps get the opportunity to have um, uh, CITL experts on hand who are waiting in the virtual wings to be able to answer any kind of remaining questions that you have. So, you know, if you leave today with an idea that you can implement in the weeks or months ahead, a golden nugget as it were, or if you have a burning question that you get answered, uh, our forum in my mind will be a success. So um, I do wanna note that while the forum is just a start of that conversations, we're gonna keep um, asking those questions and engaging uh, faculty, staff, instructors, um, so that we can continue to learn from each other and work together for better learning. Um, and you know, with my little opening remarks, I'm gonna uh, pass the virtual floor back over to Megan. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson. So I just want to let everyone know that the session is being recorded today and we're going to be sharing the recording with the university community after the event is over. So that if anyone missed it, uh, they won't miss out on hopefully all the great learnings that we're going to have here. So if you do have questions that you'd like to submit, there's two ways to do it. Um, the Q&A screen, you'll see there's a 200 
56 character limit there. So if you are typing in a question in that box, please do keep that character limit in mind. If you break it across two, um, really that just confuses me. So please try to keep them short um, and we'll be answering questions from there. The other way, thing we can do today is if you would like to speak to Dr. Watson or Dr. Timmons directly, you can let me know through that Q&A field. Just say um, that you'd like to come on screen and then with the help of Darcy, our tech expert, we'll be able to get you on screen so you can have a little bit of an interaction with um, our two panelists today. Um, but if you are doing that, I'm just going to ask you to try and keep it brief so that we can hear from as many people as possible. And I probably don't have to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, profanity, nudity, harassment, none of that is appropriate. It will not be tolerated here today. Um, so, you know, please let's keep this to a fun and good and productive event for us all. And before we get to the submitted questions, I'm going to ask Darcy to bring Dr. Shannon Hoff on screen. Dr. Hoff is an instructor with the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and is a special guest to uh, get us started and talk about their experience. And so Dr. Hoff, once you get on screen, you'll be able to turn on your camera and your mic. It just takes a little bit of time for um, those buttons to become available to you. Excellent. There you are. Hi, Dr. Hoff. Welcome. Hi, uh, thank you um, for this opportunity to talk about some of my um, strategies, my teaching strategies in this new environment. Uh, I'm in the philosophy department, so that that might be an important context setter. Um, I'm offering a, I've decided to teach using a blend of one pre-recorded lecture and one discussion session per week. Um, and I just wanted to talk about some of this, some of the uh, things that I've thought through, some of the aspects of the student situation that I've thought through and some of, and some of the strategies that I've I've invoked to sort of address those aspects, and the main thing that you know the main aspects of their situation that I've thought about is um, the sense of a kind of absence of connection with their peers and their professors, um, the fact that they're in front of their computers probably uh, most of the time, and there's a kind of different kind of pressure interacting with other students and professors through video, uh, and the fact that their space and time is is kind of undifferentiated. You know, they're they're in the same place all day, whether it's while they're eating, hanging out, um, taking classes, uh, and so on. So I've thought about a few assignments, ways of thinking through assignments that answer to those different aspects, those, those kinds of um, shortcomings in their experience right now. Uh, and one of them is, you know, with regard to this issue of making connections with their professors, um, I've, I've distributed a survey uh, a few times over the semester. Uh, so I asked just about their ex experience, what what they could do, what I could do to make it better. Um, then I asked them, you know, to talk about some idea that's interested them in philosophy, and I give them full credit for these for answering these surveys. Um, and the the these things have been wonderfully successful. Um, they they are appreciate that someone is actually interested in their situation. I and they're very forthcoming and. Um, eager to share about their situation. I then get the chance to respond to them. So we, we get to develop a kind of personal rapport uh, through that conversation and, and they feel more integrated into the class, you know, more known, more recognized. Um, and, and the fact that we, we develop a kind of rapport or personal connection um, through those question and answers, or that's, that connection wouldn't be possible over the screen. So it's, it's a little more intimate than that. Um, and I end up shaping the class better depending on the things that they say. Um, so I, I've learned a lot about the character of students' experience through asking those questions. Uh, another, another assignment that I've done in order to establish a kind of connection, especially um, between, between them, um, is that I've asked them to do a kind of op-ed assignment, which is just identify an issue they're interested in in the world, you know, going on right now or whatever, um, and then bring the philosophy that they're studying to bear implicitly upon that issue uh, instead of explicitly. So it's kind of like a, you know, get the secret philosopher in through the back door. Um, and I'm that's sort of trying to, my, my goal there is to try to respond to their sense of alienation from the world by allowing them to have a kind of connection with it through that, through discussion of that issue. Uh, and then I have them respond to each other's, I have them post this on a discussion board and I have them respond to each other's assignments. Um, and that that allows them to sort of get to know each other, and they've they've um, said that they actually do feel like they get to know each other better through these assignments. It's partly because they're actually talking about issues that are that they care about, that they're concerned about. Um, so the the issue there is that uh, they're they're showing more of who they are, 
um, in those discussion posts. And uh, and it's really actually quite an educationally valuable assignment because they're they're being asked to show the relevance of the ideas that we're studying for these issues that they're that are going on in their everyday lives. Um, and finally, another kind of assignment I've done is uh, or if I'm doing it this semester is assignment an assignment called living philosophy. Um, where I ask them a set of questions that that I ask them to reflect on while they're out in the world, you know, while they're interacting with people, while they're having conversations with people, while they're undergoing their everyday experience. Um, so examples of these kinds of things, you know, I'm teaching Plato, for instance, right now, and the questions will be, you know, reflect on the character of a conversation um, that's happening around, or the conversations that are happening around you, how are people participating, and so on. Um, reflect on the extent to which, what kind of skills of others are are manifest in your in your situation, you know, every in your everyday experiences, um, and and you know explain those. So so it, in that sense, I'm trying to get I'm trying to differentiate their 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 sense of space and time. You know, getting them to do their do educational activities while they're out in the world, um, interacting with other people, and so on. I'm trying to give them a, a space away from the computer to to learn. Um, and they they have said that they experience a sort of lack of differentiation. It's really hard for them to keep track of assignments because of this lack of differentiation um, in space and so on. Uh, they're not in the classroom, you know, hearing about the assignments. So every week I give them a rundown for the week. These are the things you have to do. Um, and with regard, just one more note about the the strategy of the blend. One pre-recorded lecture and one discussion session. They do. Um, suggest in their surveys that they miss the connection with people and they want to see people, but they also feel it very draining and very uh, pressure filled to contact people over video. So I give them the opportunity for a connection without without making it too demanding one discussion session per week and then they bring it, you know, they really come because they know it's a short, it's a one, you know, a, a, a just a small part of their learning and they appreciate the freedom that the pre recorded lectures give them. Um, so I answer to that as well. Uh, but in any case, I just wanted to, to name some of the things that I'm doing that I think are effectively responding to their situation um, and, and shaping their experience and making it into a good one. Dr. Hoff, thanks so much for sharing that, uh, you, your approaches to uh, facilitation given remote instruction. Boy, uh, Vian, that's such a rich case study, don't you think? There's so many things that are going on there. Um, what what uh, immediately jumped out to me um, was the uh, the work that you've done, Dr. Hoff, to uh, get to know your students. Um, you know, I started by saying that education learning is a social thing, which means that it's a it's a human thing, uh, and you know we really do need to know who our learners are um, for many different reasons. One, so that they feel invited to that learning community uh, of that is the classroom, but the other, so that we know. What's going on? I mean, I, I heard you say that you, you can then we're able to better connect the themes uh, and the, the material in the course to, to students' particular interests. Well, you know, relevancy, um, you, we can think about it ourselves as learners is like one of the primary ways that we have, uh, that we engage, engage deeply when we're, um, when we're learning from others is, is finding what's interesting and relevant to ourselves. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, I will note too, um, just to connect it to um, uh, some tools that everybody might have available. Um, I really like the idea of, of spending some time to check in with students. I mean, Dr. Hoff, it sounds like this is a much more integrated process throughout your entire course. But um, within Brightspace, there's a student survey tool that you can use if you're thinking, um, you know, you're an instructor and thinking, well, I, I'd like to ask students a couple of questions just to get to know what their interests are in relation to the course material. Um, and um, uh, we've tweeted about that um, earlier this week, in fact, about uh, the tool that you can use and and uh, we'd be able to, um, and anybody who's using um, the learning management system right now would be able to ask and engage students that way. So I want to make a couple of comments if I may, Gavin, is that all right? Yeah, please. I will say Shannon, um, I love your name. Uh, I, I had a sister named Shannon, but she uh, passed away. But so when I see your name, you just fills me with lots of love. So uh, it's a great name. Um, I will mention that one of the things that struck me on your teaching pedagogy was your empathy, your recognition that these these students are in front of a screen all day, your recognition about the blurring between their 
uh, academic, social, and living lives, and that you really took that, in, you made that a conscious effort to to uh, focus a little bit on that in your teaching, and that true empathy and, and recognition that their situation is challenging. And the one thing you didn't mention, but I will because I get the phone calls, is the mom and dad standing over their shoulder watching you teach them. You know, I had a parent that says she sits in on every class that her uh, her university student takes. Well, they wouldn't be able to do that if people, if the students were coming to campus. And those parents do, you know, do take moments to send me notes or tell me what they're not happy with. Um, and the students do send me notes to tell me what they are happy with. But that true empathy and understanding comes through in your pedagogy. So uh, um, I, I would love that for my kids. So well done. We had one question come into the Q&A for Dr. Hoff before we let her go. Uh, Justin Pittman is wondering how the attendance is in the live discussion sessions. What sort of percentage of class avails of that? Well, uh, um, last semester I was teaching two upper level courses uh, and the attendance was about um, two thirds. Uh, and I, I find that pretty, well, I guess it's a little bit low for upper level classes. Um, this semester I'm teaching uh, uh, 1,000 and 2,000 level classes, and I think the attendance is about, for the 1,000 class, it's probably a little lower than that, um, and and for the 2,000 class, it's probably the same, about two-thirds, possibly three-quarters sometimes. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoff. I'm now going to ask Darcy to change Dr. Hoff's status. Oh, sorry, wait, one quick question just popped in for Shannon as well. How do you accommodate students with anxiety over online participation, i.e. Zoom anxiety? Yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 I tell them at the beginning of the semester that that the conversation will typically go better if we're if we're connected by video. Um, then I obviously make it clear that I understand that many people won't be comfortable doing that. Um, and students have talked a lot about their obviously their anxiety with with video. Um, one of the things I, I did last semester was I actually got students to to lead the discussion at some point and just having the experience of doing that and, and having, you know, one of them did it without turning his video on uh, and that's fine. Um, but one of the experiences of doing that, I think, like just their involvement and their their sense that it actually worked made them feel much more comfortable and there was more participation later. So. Um, but in any case, I would be extremely flexible about whether people are willing or not willing to do that. And if a student actually told me I can't, I can't lead discussion, I that, that would make me much too anxious. I would say fine. I would just re revise the assignment for that student. I think this is a moment for being responsive um, to people, but also a moment for for just as it is it it is every semester for encouraging them to take on challenges. You know. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hoff. Um, Darcy, you can change Dr. Hoff's status, and now we're going to bring up uh, Dr. Jeff Rideout. Dr. Rideout is in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science, and so uh, Dr. Rideout, once you get on screen, you'll see your mute and video buttons will turn on for you to be able so that we can see you and hear you. I see you're almost there, and I am going to ask folks to try to keep their remarks a little bit brief if you can. We're already halfway through our time today, and maybe this means we just need to have more of these forums in the future, but I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Rideout. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope your semester is going well. How's my audio, uh, uh, Megan? Is it good? Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Uh, when uh, uh, Dr. Timmons talked about the parents standing over the shoulders of the students, uh, reminded me of I was at a neighbor's house uh, in the fall, and she said, I went upstairs, and I heard your voice coming from my daughter's bedroom. And I was initially kind of shocked and maybe I'll admit a little alarmed and then she realized that the student was listening to one of my online lectures so so there is that but uh, uh, Shannon one of the things you mentioned that I've been working on for a while now and which is for me something I have to make a really active concerted effort to do is to make that connection as I teach in the mechanical engineering department and uh, we teach math stuff and uh, there's not a lot of shades of gray at least in the junior courses and uh, it's very difficult to get any sort of discussion going on we're happy if we can just get questions and uh, 
one of the things I really try to do is uh, I try to collect the students before I direct them. And I'm, I'm cribbing that from a child psychologist named Gordon Neufeld. So this may be a reckless extrapolation of child psychology, but I, I, I force the students to say good morning. Really, I'm forcing myself to say good morning to the students. And in an in-person class, I would look at them and I would make eye contact and I would try to establish some kind of a, of a rapport. In the old days in WebEx, you could force them to unmute and I'd say, good morning, everybody. I want to hear some actual people. I don't want to just see gray squares and chat beeps. And people would, you know, a lot of good mornings. It was at least as good as when you're in church and the minister says good morning. And that's when people really try to step up with the, with the hello. So I do that. Uh, and I do it at the, at the end of the lecture as well. And I also do something which called bridging. At the end of the lecture, I tell them, you know, what we're going to do next. And I, I, I assure them, that, you know, I'm looking forward to our next discussion. And I try to bridge our current contact to our, our next contact. So I'm trying to, I suppose, replicate whatever amount of connection one could get in an in-person experience. And part of connection effort is around academic integrity. Uh, we've had a lot of anecdotal and verified evidence of cheating in a number of engineering courses when the students have been given completely uninvigilated exams. And there's two ways we can approach that. We can either try to be the big bad cops and we can say, we know you're going to cheat and we are going to get you and we're going to pin you to the wall when we do, so don't do it. Or a lot of the uh, the literature on this says you're better off to establish a connection with the class in the first place so that they aren't going to want to cheat because they'd feel like they were, you know, doing something bad to you or, or they were compromising, you know, they, they would lose your respect. So uh, last fall, I had, uh, I did a, an academic integrity survey, which I administered through Brightspace. It was an anonymous survey, and it must be anonymous. Uh, just a bunch of Likert scale examples of, you know, have you ever considered doing this? Uh, does copying an assignment constitute cheating? Can you still be a, a successful professional engineer if you cheat your way through a couple of courses? And then I would pull all the stats together and I would have a discussion with the class in lecture time and say, here's, here's what you folks think. You know, anything interesting in here? Uh, I would also ask questions about things like uh, online invigilation because I do have a successful model for online invigilation. And the questions that would come up, a lot of them in the open form part of the survey, students were just afraid of the unknown or they wanted to demystify the expectations around the tests and exams. So it gave really good form for a, a really good back and forth conversation with the students. And, and, and even though it was mostly over the chat instead of audio, because these were classes of 65 or 70 students, I really did feel like there was um, a good back and forth discussion. And I felt like the students left that feeling better about the whole experience and knowing what I expected of them. Uh, so uh, I think establishing that connection is good, not only for the, the, the enjoyment of the experience for you and for the students, but also it can feed into a bit of an academic integrity enhancement um, initiative. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've already spoken for a few minutes. I can, I can stop there and I can, I can take questions, or I can tell you about a few nuts and bolts things that have worked for me as well. Jeff, I just want to um, acknowledge how challenging um, ensuring uh, students adhere to um, academic integrity um, is within this environment. There's lots of uh, examples of where um, the shift to remote um, means that uh, students have access to tools and, and means of, of information that they wouldn't have had before. It's really a challenge I see um, that you've addressed in part by exploring what academic integrity means to students uh, within this new context and then having a conversation. Because I do think that um, while there are new, that there are sites like CHEG um, where um, students can share questions and get answers, in some cases, um, it, it's quite obvious that that's a, a deviation from academic integrity. Um, for others, um, uh, the context of the remote semester, the remote year, um, 
um, perhaps drives behaviors as well. And so it's a, it, you know, it's not just as simple as saying don't do it. It's about it's about having that conversation and uh, articulating expectations, uh, allowing students to understand what's um, what's deemed unacceptable, especially in this new context. And um, and then also um, you pointed it out too, and that is. Um, building that personal connection so that they've got an understanding of, of who's um, being impacted um, as well. Anyway, I just wanted to, uh, to, to highlight those pieces. And I, I want to make a comment too, Jeff, because, you know, one of the very basic pedagogical principles that you practice um, is that you tell students what you're going to teach. You teach students what you said you were going to teach. You tell them what you taught them and then you tell them what you're going to teach them the next time. And that seems so simple, but you will not believe how many classes I have walked into over the years where a professor starts a lecture and there's no context or framing for the students. So that, you know, that setting up and then that delivering and then that reviewing and then that forecasting is a very, uh, a very basic pedagogical principle that we teach in teacher education and um, you do it every class you said you know and you would be surprised how that grounds students and how it makes them really know what's coming and better prepared uh, so thank you it's, like i said it seems simple but sharing that and letting people know that some that those basic pedagogical principles we do them every time students anticipate them they know it's coming they're prepared um, and it gives a structure so well done well done, Jack. Thank you. I don't have the intention of doing it every class. Uh, yeah. What's that? Sorry, I, would say, I would say I have intention of doing it every class. It is still easy to slip into a bad habit when we feel like we have to cover all the material. And if I may, uh, Gavin, uh, the one point I'd conclude on is I started doing this flipped hybrid format about three years ago, not because I knew there was a pandemic coming, but because I wanted to get the theory and the derivations online so students could watch it at their own pace and rewind it. Um, and I would have live problem solving sessions where I would I would work examples and, and, and get a lot of student questions. Or the students could show up and, and do work on their assignments. Uh, and the feedback I got was that my courses were way, way harder than all the other courses they did. And I'd read warnings in the flipped lecture literature about how it's so easy for your course to turn into a course and a half. It's so easy to throw an extra little video up there. Uh, we, we, we can do a polished 75 minute lecture, but that may have taken you 150 minutes in a class. So it took me three years before I got the course content down to the appropriate workload compared to the other courses in the students' programs. So last fall, I looked like a hero. He goes, oh, Dr. Rideout, your course is like a regular course and all the other profs, uh, you know, it feels like it's twice as much work. And I said, well, it took me three years to get to this place. And I'm just kind of lucky that I got on this bandwagon when I did. I, I asked the students to have compassion for my colleagues. And I ask all of us to be kind to ourselves in recognizing there is a learning curve where it takes a long time to figure out what these new formats really look like and feel like from the student experience. So the hardest thing is when in doubt, cut something out. And uh, you know, especially in the, 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 the online uh, format where it's so easy for things to get accelerated without you even realizing it as an instructor. Thanks for those uh, that that reflection, Jeff. I think um, what you said there is incredibly important um, that uh, as we shift modalities or ways that we teach uh, it's simply not just a case of taking what worked in the classroom and applying it online there needs to be some interpretation and reconceptualization because as you point out um, you can have a rich and impactful learning experience in the shorter amount of time online um, just by virtue of the the media and uh, the the recorded video and how that um, allows for the uh, students to review that um, you can be uh, really sort of succinct or different than you would be in the classroom. So yeah, I think it's, it's that's valuable reflection. Thank you. And Thank students you. Have, been, have been saying that the workload has seems to be so much more for them because of the very things you talk about, Jeff, that when it's online, and I know when I did online teaching, 
it was a lot more work for the students than if I was teaching them face to face because I had exactly what you talked about. You know, more resources, videos, things to show them that I, that I, my expectation was that they did on their own time. And uh, we really, uh, I love that idea when in doubt, cut it out. That's a great term. Great. Term. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Tim is one of the things that I talk about uh, when uh, I'm talking with faculty members and instructors who are challenged with this is is really to use the the measure of of six months from now. If you were to run into a student who had taken your course uh, uh, in the street uh, and they were telling you about their learning experience, what is it that you hope that they would tell you? What the, what is it that they remember six months from now? And that becomes your um, your guiding star as far as how you decide what kind of learning experiences to incorporate and which ones that you can leave aside. Wonderful, thank you. I'm gonna ask Darcy now to uh, let Dr. Rideout change statuses back to audience member because we do have one more special guest that we wanna bring up and I do have some questions to get through. And maybe in the interest of trying to keep things moving along, I'm gonna ask you to a question and while Darcy brings, um, oh, never mind. Darcy's ahead of me. Tom Halford is coming on screen now. He works in the Department of English at Grenville campus. We're so happy to have you here. Um, don't forget that once you're on screen, you'll be able to unmute yourself and turn on your video um, once the controls. There you are. <laughs> Over Give to you. A minute. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I want to just sort of reiterate what Jeff was saying about just enjoying doing video. I, I've really appreciated the opportunity to do that and the opportunity to edit myself as I'm lecturing because when I'm doing live lectures and in-person lectures, I say so many things and then I think about them for like the next two days. So the chance to do video has been wonderful for me. Um, what I wanted to do, I, I'm gonna be really quick, but I wanted to share an activity I did with my class. Um, so I teach a course on rhetoric and one of the things that we're doing this week, we're doing the rhetoric of universities and we read an article in, or you know, a short piece in University Affairs that was about the seven missing pieces of online lectures and just how some students can find it you know they feel a little bit detached from it all but i was really curious to try to invert it and do a more positive version of that and i asked students to to write seven seven um, working pieces for for online learning and i was really surprised at how positive they were um, you know i think the thing that they're really missing is just talking to each other uh, more than anything else but they came up with seven things and they were really sort of enthusiastic about them, about seven things that are actually really good about the situation that we're in right now. The number one thing they said was that they have more time for friends and family. So they're working from home and they actually get to be around people who they really care about. Um, they don't get to have that sort of on-campus experience, but at least they get to be home for an additional year. Um, they loved the flexibility with their schedule. So that was the second thing they said. Um, the, the third thing they said that they is that they love saving money and they made a couple jokes about eating their parents food. The fourth thing was they find it so much more comfortable than being on campus. Um, and I know from as as a teacher, I'm finding it almost too comfortable to be home. Um, they find it a lot easier to chat. Online than in person, um, the way I do my classes, I do two asynchronous and then one live class. So. I, I just let them do whatever they feel most comfortable doing. If they want to be on video, they can. If they want to just have their mics on, they can, or they can just type. And so a lot of cho students choose to type. And I really feel like I get, I'm get i getting to talk to students who I never would have gotten to talk to before, because I feel like the students who are really shy will never speak up in class, but they will type something out in the chat box. Um, so I think that that's a real positive element. Um, one of the more practical things they brought up was that there's no commute. And, you know, in Cornerbrook, I think that that is a that is something that's really positive because we get so much bad weather that for them to be able to work from home is a wonderful thing. They don't get any snow days, so that's a bit of a negative too, but still. Um, and then the last thing they, they talked about was just how how much less stressful it is to be tested when they're online. And so, I mean, those are seven things of, I thought were really great about um, the experience that we, I mean, we don't want to be in this experience, but, but it's, there are some good things. Thanks Tom, for sharing to those. That's, uh, that's great to hear um, because often we, we uh, focus about just the deficit of what we've lost with this shift and it's exciting 
to reflect on some of the changes can can um, can be seen as a as a benefit. Um, I, I really like the idea that uh, you, that you've articulated that um, these approaches, especially the 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 chat textual chat allows for a wider variety of participation. I think we need to be really considerate of just who participates in our face to face classrooms. Um, it's pretty clear from the literature that it tends to be people like me, guys who uh, uh, who are white, um, you know, who are part of the the broader uh, and, and larger uh, demographic. And there are students who don't feel comfortable for um, because they're shy or because they're concerned that their perspectives will be seen as different um, or not accepted and and they in turn don't participate um, but you know that that chat um, is so important because that's how we make meaning we talk through ideas we engage with others we check our understanding and then we come back again so the more that we can do to uh, facilitate uh, a more equitable engagement uh, in participation in class is a great thing. So uh, I think that's what, you know, for me, that's one of the things that uh, I'll be asking um, others to think about is as we move forward out of this, how can we make our classrooms more equitable? And what have we learned um, from our own teaching practices at this point that increase that accessibility and equity? And I love the assignment you did. Talk about getting them to focus on the positive stuff. Uh, that they experience in online learning. I mean, some again, I told you what I hear always the challenges, but having them focus and recognize the positive uh, aspects of their learning online, I, I think that's brilliant, just brilliant. So well done. Well done, Tom. Thanks. I have a question here for Tom from Lori Hogan. Uh, she wants to know if you have any suggestions for chat management when teaching synchronously. Oftentimes it's, or sometimes it's awkward to pause to check or distracting to constantly monitor. That is very true. It is, it is awkward. I think that for me, at least I just try to get comfortable with, you know, those, those moments of silence, because I think even if you're teaching in person, you have to just stand there and wait for somebody to talk sometimes. And I think you have to be a little bit comfort with, comfortable with awkwardness but what i so what i try to do is i try to get them in the chat and if there's a pause or i'm watching somebody type i move on to the next thing and i tell them to feel comfortable typing even though i've moved on and then i go back to it um but i i don't know i think some some awkwardness is fine so long as it's not um, too distracting for the students i guess Great, thanks. And I think sometimes it feels more awkward when you are the one who feels like you should be filling it in as yeah. opposed to the people who are listening and, and waiting. Um, well, thank you so much, Tom, for You're joining welcome. us today. Yeah, Darcy. Bye. Bye. Sorry, Megan, for talking over top of you. <laughs> oh, that's fine. And I'm going to get to some of the questions that came in via email now. Um, a number of other notable Canadian universities have now recognized value in the idea of teaching stream faculty, which allows faculty members who are committed to excellence in teaching to focus more intently on that mission. Um, what thoughts do Dr. Timmons and Dr. Watson or members of the community have about the prospect and potential for a teaching stream model to be created at Memorial? That was a question from Jana Rosales. So I can speak to that because I was at the University of Regina that had that teaching stream model that works very, very well. And uh, people through the tenure process and uh, the scholarship of teaching is recognized and honored. So I'm a, a big supporter of that, but it is something that has to be negotiated through collective agreements. And so it needs, you know, it needs advocates within uh, the professor. Uh, the professor's ranks that will, you know, want to see it happen. But um, at, I know that at Memorial, it's something that I would support if it was brought forward as um, the teaching stream as an option. Uh, I'll also echo that um, I would support it as well. I think we have to be really cautious around how it gets um, operationalized or uh, how what it looks like. Um, teaching streams that uh, sounds like not at the University of Regina, but at other uh, other institutions can often be a place where um, obviously faculty would have an increased um, load as far as teaching is concerned, but they're not expected to engage in any kind of research. And I think that's a mistake. Dr. Timmons, you would you uh, note, for example, that um, the scholarship of teaching and learning is important. And I would say that there would be an expectation. I would provide the advice that there'd be an expectation that anybody who's in a teaching stream position would engage in scholarship. Uh, it would be the scholarship of teaching and learning within their discipline. 
Um, I also think we have to be really cognizant of, of equity um, and pay. Um, the research suggests that these uh, teaching stream positions are uh, predominantly um, filled by those that identify uh, as, uh, as women. Um, and there can be a difference in pay. Um, and so I would want to ensure that um, that we're that we're taking those kinds of questions into consideration as we're thinking about how we turn this into practice. But if we could have a a, a category of faculty members whose primary focus is on teaching and learning, have the opportunity to engage in progress through the ranks, who engage in research, and who are remunerated in a similar fashion to our other streams of faculty, then I think it's it's nothing but a, a win win as far as the institution is concerned. Thank you. Next question comes from Benjamin J. Soraya, and he says he finds it challenging to make students talk or participate. If there's any comment you could offer there, it would be really useful. Um, Dr. Timmons, I, I was going to actually, uh, with this question, invite two of my colleagues. That would be um, Denise Carew uh, and uh, 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 Julie Temple to come and uh, perhaps provide some suggestions here, or, or if you're open Excellent. to that. I, I'm, yeah. I'm curious to what they're going to tell. Uh, All right. Myself. Well. And I'm just going to do my usual reminder of time. We have 11 minutes left. And uh, Denise and Julie, don't forget that when you get on screen, you'll be able to turn on your cameras. You're a step ahead. <laughs> okay, I can get us started, Julie, if that's okay. Uh, I think some of the things for uh, engaging students during a lecture have already been mentioned a little bit. Um, one of the things that I would definitely uh, recommend is that upfront we set up that expectation for students. But not just setting up the expectation, we also, um, I think I'm looking the wrong way. <laughs> I think we, it's also important for, to give them options. So in a lot of the um, online tools that we would use for our lectures and so on, there will be options for video, uh, chat, which has been mentioned, um, audio, using emoticons and so on like that. Gavin mentioned that, you know, having that interaction, being able to talk through things, it's how we make meaning. And so setting up that expectation uh, is really important. I just wanted to mention that with the chat in particular, there's a couple of different ways that you could do chat. And so if students are not comfortable putting things in a chat message for their whole class to see, they can uh, put a chat message in that goes to you privately. And so you can still monitor the chat, but the students can put it in so that only you can see it. Uh, so that is an option for some, uh, some students. Uh, if you have a very large class, you could ask for a co-facilitator, like a TA to come into your class and they could help you monitor the chat as well. So you could pause every few minutes uh, in that case if students are, um, they, they could use their audio or their video to engage in the conversation. Uh, but you could also get the moderator to, you know, um, monitor the chat and um, you could ask the questions directly uh, of students. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Julie, but I'll just mention one other thing uh, that comes to mind in your lectures is that students are often more comfortable talking amongst themselves and not in that bigger uh, room with you there perhaps. Um, so you could use, uh, and you'd have to plan for this, but you could use uh, breakout rooms for that. So putting students in smaller groups like four or five or, you know, up to 10 perhaps. Uh, and then you could go in and out of those breakout rooms. But often when students are in smaller groups like that, they're more comfortable in chatting and, and discussing the, the content. Thanks, Denise. Um, I think really when we're talking about having students participate, it's going back to building our relationships with our students. Um, and Dr. Hoff talked quite a bit about that um, and some of the strategies that she uses. So it's about connection and creating community in the classroom um, and doing so in a way that's accessible uh, and inclusive and equitable. So I wanted to let the people who are listening know we have a handout on the CITL website called, Cre called Creating Community in Your Remote Course, where we have a whole number um, of different suggestions for how you can build community and relationships with your students, uh, which does also help them uh, participate. And then that has links within it uh, to other resources. So please have a look at that. Um, Denise has already discussed the importance of offering a number of different kinds of options for participation to students. 
Um, and uh, I really like the idea that Dr. Hoff shared around surveying students about their needs um, at the beginning of the semester and then communicating with, uh, with them about that, um, offering to problem solve issues that might come up with them. Um, and I'll add one more uh, option that you can do at the beginning of the semester, which is to meet with students either individually, depending on your class numbers, or you could do it in small groups. Talk to them about participation in the class. Talk to them about um, concerns that they might have, why you feel it's important, what options they could have um, to participate, and how engaging in class is going to build their learning experience. Um, and in my experience as a teacher, uh, making those connections and building that relationship right from the beginning of the semester um, will help to set the stage so they can participate more. Thank you, Julie and Denise for sharing your insights. I'm going to move on to another question now. Um, we heard from Julie Pitcher Giles, who says so far we've spoken about creating connection in remote teaching and learning, but what about courses that are fully online that don't typically always have live connection points? Do you have any thoughts or suggestions there, Dr. Watson? So just so that I understand the context is we're talking about um, creating connections and when we're not connecting synchronously, like over a video uh, conference. I, I, I know, Megan, you can't answer that specifically, but I'm just that's where I'm going to go uh, with my uh, Julie's just gone into the Q&A and said yes. Um, I think um, I don't want to oversimplify it, but again, it's around um, taking the techniques that we've seen or at least heard about and applying them asynchronously. So um i really just to pick up on what um uh, uh julie had mentioned around uh, p uh, potentially offering to meet with students one-on-one -on -one or in groups um i can see that happening asynchronously uh through um a, a, dis a private discussion forum you could set up discussion forums that only certain um, students can participate in small groups um, where they can um, ask and answer questions um you can build community uh by um um, also engaging uh, with them um, in any kind of uh, of the techniques that we saw, but adapted asynchronously. I'm not going to provide a list, uh, but uh, certainly having, uh, you know, like Dr. Timmons, I started teaching online in the early aughts and um, it, it was primarily um, asynchronous because it was all dial up at that point or it was really low speed connections. Um, and uh, it was we worked to build connection, by having students introduce themselves with to one another, um, get an understanding of who they are outside of the classroom and then um, build that relevance into the uh, facilitation of the course. The other thing I'll mention is that, you know, office hours can be done remotely and online and can be an opportunity to hear students concerns, connect with students, you know, um, for all of your courses. And, and to do a town hall with your students uh, can, can also, during your office hours, can be a real positive experience. And it's not that complicated to set that up and have that happen. I, I really feel as though uh, um, that even with a course that's fully designed to be online, um, meaning that the whole experience, the course could be completed without uh, a synchronous engagement like we're having right now, offering a, um, uh, an optional a WebEx a check-in uh, to kick off the course and maybe to close the course would be one great way of improving um, engagement. Uh, and is doesn't and if if a student can't participate because of internet connectivity or scheduling issues, if you record it, they can review it and and follow up as well. And related to that question, uh, Jillian Westcott said that she sends individual emails to each student in her course at the two week mark to ask them how the course is going, if they have any questions, concerns, sessions, uh, suggestions for improvement. And Julie Pitcher Giles chimed in to say, thank you. I feel like the desire from students to create these connection points is much higher than before times. And she feels like these efforts are truly appreciated by our students. Now I'm going to quickly um, ask Darcy to bring Christine Arnold on screen. Dr. Arnold works in the Faculty of Education. I know we only have a few minutes left and I do apologize for the shortness of time, but I believe she had some points that she wanted to make as well. So in a second, you'll be able to turn on your video and unmute yourself. Dr. Arnold. Hi everyone. How are you today? Um, I'm from the Faculty of Education and much I think Dr. Arnold might be having connection issues, or is this me having connection issues? 
I hope it's not you, because if it's you, then it's me as well. And one of the challenges, of course, that we face with online courses or working remotely um, is this. Dr. Arnold? I'm afraid we don't have a connection here um, and we're running out of time. Are you back? No, I'm afraid it doesn't seem like it's working. Thirsty, if you'd like to change Dr. Arnold's uh, status back and we'll follow up to apologize for this after the event and uh, perhaps see if there's another way that we can share the message that she wanted to share uh, with the university community. Since we are at two minutes too, perhaps I'll pass it over to Dr. Timmons for some concluding remarks. Just uh, Dr. Watson, do you want to have a couple of remarks and then I'll close? Sure, thanks. Um, I, I first want to say thank you to everybody who shared an experience or asked a question or participated in the Q&A. Uh, it's great that you engaged uh, actively or passively by uh, watching uh, us today have this conversation. I just want to uh, reinforce the idea that uh, our virtual and physical door is always open. CITL is available and here for you. So please connect to, con excuse me, continue to connect with us. If you have a question, a challenge, or even if you're having a teaching success that you'd like to share. And obviously the best way to reach out to us given uh, the uh, circumstances that we're in right now is to use our support center. Uh, which is available online seven days a week, or connect with your academic units uh, support representative. And if you would like to, me directly. I'm on Twitter by email. I'm always uh, happy to engage with uh, uh, staff, faculty, and instructors. Dr. Timmons? So there's been a, almost 100 of you online, and it's been a great hour. I loved listening to a discussion about teaching, and I'm thrilled that 100 of our memorial community members are doing that. You know, teaching is something that is an art, but it's something that you can always improve. And as someone who's passionate about teaching, I love seeing people take workshops, learn more, uh, understand a flipped classroom, understand universal design, understand, uh, you know, how students, uh, simple things that active learning in a university classroom. So I'd encourage you to continue to do this. Uh, we need to ensure that the conversation about teaching you know, is visible and on our campus happening all the time. Uh, Gavin and his team are doing a phenomenal job. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for being uh, the moderator extraordinaire. You have done so many of these town halls now. And I think people are going to be knocking on your door to hire you. But remember who you work for. That's Memorial. That's us. So everyone, thank you. Um, th this got me so excited that we have so many people interested in talking about uh, one of the key components of our university, the one of the things that matters the most to, to our students, and that is teaching and learning. And uh, it, you just all inspire me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Megan. You want to close us off? Thanks, sure. Megan. Thanks, everybody. No problem. I do apologize to folks whose question we didn't get to. We will look through them and see if there's a way that we can answer those in a different format moving forward. Because uh, we do really appreciate appreciate you taking the time to participate today. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye.